evening convocation. And we're so pleased that you have joined us this evening for what we consider to be a very significant event. It is something to get a group like this out of an evening for a lecture. Our convocations are usually held during the day, but we did want to make it possible for many people to join us this evening, and we're happy that you've come. I think there is a fortunate uh, confluence of uh, circumstances that make this particular uh, lecture tonight by Dr. Hill possible. We do have a convocation committee here at Augsburg that concerns itself with providing our academic community with a variety of exposures in various types of convocations. We also have on our campus the office of the Norseman's Federation, the Normans Verbundet, as it is called in the native language of some. And uh, we have cooperated with uh, the local chapter on securing Dr. Hill this evening, who comes to us from the University of Minnesota, which uh, is another one of the resources of Augsburg College. And uh, we uh, try to bring these various elements together whenever we can, and we think this evening is an indication of that. So uh, we're very pleased that Dr. Reuben Hill is here this evening, uh, sponsored by our convocation committee and by the local chapter of the Norseman's Federation. And uh, there are representatives of the college's academic activity on the platform, a representative in Mr. Sherrod Miller from our Department of Sociology, and Mr. War Roy Thorshov, who is the president of the local chapter of Norman's Verbundet. And I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce these gentlemen. Sherrod, will you stand? And uh, you can clap for him. He's a good man. I envy that Daniel Boone outfit he's got on there. That's, uh, that's really something. Uh, and uh, then uh, my good friend Roy Thorshov, who has been on the campus many times. Uh, Roy, you stand up and take a bow, too. <laughs> Dr. Hill's lecture tonight, I think, uh, and his presence here, uh, focus on many of the concerns that we have here at Augsburg College. We, of course, are interested in those who are eminent in the area of scholarship and of research, and certainly Dr. Hill is that. Uh, his area is sociology, and uh, we are proud of our emphasis upon sociology, social work, urban problems, the family, uh, through our own department here under the direction of Dr. Joel Torstensen. And so to have a teacher and a writer and a researcher and leader in this field of note is our privilege. Dr. Hill is also internationally known. He is presently the chairman of the International Sociological Association and uh, has been primarily concerned with that organization's emphasis in the area of family and family planning. And of course, when he concerns himself with this area, he's dealing with fundamental human values that are also of deep concern to us here at Augsburg College. So tonight he's speaking on the very interesting and timely topic, is there a future for the family? Uh, this is an issue that I guess has a certain amount of suspense to it. Uh, and perhaps there are some tentative conclusions that can be reached. Uh, last evening at this time, many of us were sitting here in the bleachers watching a ball game uh, that uh, had some issues that were in doubt. Uh, until the final second of the first overtime, and uh, finally that was issue that was uh, settled. I um, wish sometimes that we could be as enthusiastic about these much more fundamental problems than we are about settling a basketball game. But whenever the Norwegians manage it over the Swedes, that too is an important event. But I hope that there is uh, anticipation and uh, excitement and uh, deep interest in the subject tonight, and so I'm happy to welcome Dr. Reuben Hill from the University of Minnesota uh, to Augsburg College. I want to express the appreciation of our institution to the Normans for Abundant for making this possible. And without further ado, I will introduce to you at this time Dr. Hill. Thank you, President Anderson, and distinguished uh, Norseman and uh, 
neighbors uh, from Augsburg, I am delighted to uh, be here. You do me honor in asking me on this occasion to consider with you how problematic the future of the family is. I wrote a chapter in a book about 30 years ago, which is before many of you were born, called Tomorrow's Family. And I was much more confident about writing then about what tomorrow's family would be and stressed the importance of the new inventions that were coming and the changes that they would bring in the life of women in the home, the house husbands uh, in the home, and uh, the children and the chores that they would no longer have to perform. Well, I lived to uh, wait for some 20 or 30 years before most of those inventions became really available, and they are only now becoming sufficiently uh, inexpensive that they're part of the repertory of most uh, families. In 1963, I was more modest. I was asked to give a talk on the American family of the future. And tonight, I even put a question mark after the title, Does the Family Have a Future? So that you can see something about uh, aging, can't you, in the confidence with which we deal with the future. Thirty years ago, I was sure I had a future. Uh, and, of course, the family did have. And ten years ago, I could talk about the American family with a future. And tonight, I'm raising the question about whether the family has a future. You may know that several provocative books have been addressed to the question, one of the most thoughtful of which is Jesse Bernard's The Future of Marriage, which I commend for your reading. She assesses candidly past family forms, present family forms, the utopias, the wished-for family forms, the innovations, and then she somewhat wryly pokes fun at the utopians since they're almost all men. She uh, looks at the innovations that seem to be implied by the strident demands of women's liberation and seems considerably more attractive, attracted by these. Another book, Herbert Otto's is entitled, The Family in Search of a Future. This may be the soundest way of approaching it. The Family in Search of a Future. What kinds of families have a future, rather than does the family have a future? Large, all-purpose families, performing all range of services, probably no future. Flexible, adaptable, moderately or small-sized families, possibly. Jesse Bernard cautions that men have a much better deal in contemporary marriage than women. You wouldn't know it to hear the men before marriage. They speak of single blessedness and of... Uh, the, what is it, the ball and chain and other things, and they speak of having been hooked and having been stuck and having been caught, but married men live longer than single men. They're healthier and happier than bachelors. Married women, on the contrary, are less well-off than unmarried women, but they make as if they are better off. They're less happy on many counts. They are less mentally healthy. If it comes down to it, they value parenthood more than they do marriage. In fact, Dr. Bernard, in a series of statistical tables, 
taken from countrywide statistics, says that marriage make women sick. Now, these may uh, not fit with our usual notions of the greater investment that women have in continuing family uh, life, their greater investment in getting married, because they do seem much more eager to marry than men, and perhaps because they are so eager to marry, they have greater expectations and perhaps because men are somewhat more loath to marry, they are more surprised that it is, is as good as it is. Well, does the family have a future? What time span should we consider? The next marital cohort, that is, the marriage licenses that are applied for this year, ending in marriage, is a family of the future, isn't it? So is that the family of the future we should look at? There are new families forming each year. Is it the next generation? Mrs. Hill and I uh, have had five children. As they marry, are they the next future family? Is it the family of the year 2000? Family futures, you see, can be examined within different time spans. I can't treat all of these issues in my address, and I will welcome, if it's within the pattern, uh, questions afterward in line with your interests. But I want to uh, start you thinking about whether or not for many the future is already here, and as I move into my discussion, I'm going to give you a picture of the family of the future, which is the young married child generation of the present. Let me, though, stop because I want to set some uh, counter brush fires to the mass media. The mass media are global and sweeping and simple in their generalizations about the family. They tend to sensationalize for whatever purposes and rarely miss the occasion to point out the strains experienced by families with headlines such as the family in crisis. Time ran an entire section on the family in crisis last year. Is the family doomed, said Look, just before Look sees publication. <laughs> The family lasted longer than look, you see. <laughs> Is the family obsolete, was Red Book's uh, series. But last month and this month, a counter-movement, the Reader's Digest, the myth of the vanishing family, so that they fight back and forth with sensationalism, you see. A former Fortune magazine editor in his bestseller, Future Shock, writes of the fractured family and quotes Lundberg, a psychiatrist, the family is near the point of extinction, and a psychoanalyst, Wolf, that the family is dead except for the first year or two of child rearing, that this will be its only function. And he quotes others that the family is racing toward oblivion, but he notes that these pessimisms, pessimists seldom tell us what will take its place. And then after noting a series of contemporary changes and in innovations such as wife swapping and group living and communes and serial polygyny and homosexual marriages and unmarried women and now men rearing children without benefit of marriage, and the dissociation of sex for fun from reproduction, he offers his own prediction that the family may neither vanish nor enter upon a golden age, but is far more likely to shatter, only to come together again in weird and novel ways. I would like uh, Mr. Toffler, the editor and author of that piece, to live long enough to see that the majority of families will be ever so familiar 
and so much the same that he will have to eat his words as I have had to eat mine from my Blythe Tomorrow's Family description. The economist Kenneth Boulding, in refreshing contrast, observes in his address the family segment of the national economy that change in the last 50 years has been more a, one of degree than of kind compared with the years 1870 to 1920. He says those were the years of basic change, basic inventions, basic speed-ups of all sorts, and the only really new things that have come into our lives in the last uh, 20 years, he says, are television, plastics, and convenience foods. From Bowling's standpoint, the rate of qualitative change may be decelerating, and he foresees relatively minor changes, therefore, in the households of tomorrow. Do you feel confused with all of these uh, predictions and counter-predictions and disagreements? The mass media have been telling us that we are in a period of rapid change, not only of rapid change but of increasing change, and that we can hardly absorb it. And Bolding says nothing really fundamental has happened in the last 20 years except perhaps television, plastics, and convenience foods, and they have just made us sit and get fatter. Well, may I now provide my own perspective about the issue of family development in our changing society. And I'm doing it uh, from the vantage point of having been blessed with Mrs. Hill and our children with a good bit of travel. I've lived, we have lived for a prolonged period of time in each of the major regions of the United States, in Puerto Rico, in Belgium, in Europe. And we visited India and Japan. For two years, I served as consultant for the Ford Foundation's population program in North Africa, the Middle East, Mexico, and Asia. I'm currently, as President Anderson has indicated, president of the International Sociological Association. And for eight years, I served as chairman of its Committee on Family Research, working through UNESCO to train family researchers in several different countries of Europe, Asia, and the Americas. And I continue in direct contact through the several members of this committee with basic family data from many of these countries. Through study and personal observations, I've become acquainted with the similarities and differences in family patterns by class, ethnic background, and region in several of these countries. The perspective from which I speak, therefore, reflects this exposure to the wide range of problems and problem solutions found in many societies of the world today. Now, what I conclude is that although the structural forms of marriage in the family vary from society to society and within regions and class straight of societies, as the forms of marriage in the family, of how many women are married to a man and how many men might be married to a woman, and what the relationships are between parents and children and among siblings and what the kinship obligations are, these forms vary. But the functions carried out by families show high similarities. Moreover, the direction of changes in form and functioning appear very similar in all of the industrializing countries of the world. Household size location of power in decision-making, marriage forms, sex and age roles, rules for residence and rules for inheritance, and methods of reckoning kinship. These are the forms, the structures, and they show marked variations. But the functional assignments of socializing, motivating, and restoring family members in what has been termed the area of tension management appear common to all of the societies that we've studied. In none of these countries is the family regarded as functionless, despite the psychiatrist's statement 
that the family can only exist for the first few years of child rearing. Uh, none of the uh, countries are reporting functionless families. Indeed, it's a highly visible, flourishing institution in most of the world. I should say, therefore, that my point of view is less one of despair about the future of the family and more one of respect for its flexibility, its resilience, and its capacity for survival and growth under such varied societal sponsorships. Now, it's taking a beating from a number of people whose present views are that the family ought to be the scapegoat for all of the ills of society, but it'll survive those people. The continued development and elaboration of the family institution within the relatively affluent and beneficent environment of urban industrial America hardly seems to me to be problematic although I don't deny that affluence brings its own set of stresses for family. Certainly our society is far, far from the most hostile social and economic order yet encountered by marriage and family institutions. If we look at the family of Western civilization as a phenomenon growing and changing over time, more options are probably open to families today and will be tomorrow to experiment, to invent and innovate than in any previous epoch. Family people have never had it so good from the standpoint of freedom to grow and develop and innovate and experiment. Now let me document my position. There's first of all a favorable climate for family life in America widespread affirmation of the values of marriage and family living. Americans have long been known as the most marrying people in the world. There was a time in our distant past in Europe when only the well-to-do could marry and when you had to be able to prove that you could support a family to marry. 97% of women and 96% of men marry in the United States today compared to 70% in many countries of Western Europe. The proportion in the marrying ages 14 to 90, which are married, is higher than ever before in our history, having increased from about 60% in 1940 to 68% in 1960 and it's been vacillating around that level since. There's a sort of 20-some-odd uh, uh, percent that are in the single uh, status and looking forward to marriage, and a certain small number in the disconnected, divorce-separated status also looking forward to marriage, and a certain number in the widowed status. But we have a higher proportion of that population 14 to 90 married than ever before in our history. Now this has been achieved in part by marrying off young people at earlier ages, and they may be getting wise and waiting a little bit more now, but also by high remarriage rates of the divorced and widowed. By age 30, roughly 90 percent of men have been married at least once. Of those who divorce, 75 percent of men and 60% of women remarry. Moreover, the proportion of the population in the divorced or separated statuses has, re has remained constant from decade to decade at 2% divorced and 3% separated. They don't remain divorced or separated long enough to be counted more than at uh, this small percentage. Marriedness as a status is clearly a most desirable state of affairs. A cynic might say, you've oversold the status of marriage, that marriage may not be met for everyone, that everyone isn't for marriage, and that many may be disappointed, but it is a most valued status. Another indication of our valuing of marriage in the family is the, is the rather close correspondence between family 
goals with respect to family size desired and completed family size achieved. Completed family size declined over a 200-year period in America from eight children per family in the 1700s to two and a half children in 1950. And don't ask me how they delivered that half child. And then without much notice, it increased within the decade to reach a level of between three and four children. At the level of preferences, families of three and four children appeared in this period of the 50s and 60s to be preferred by 85% of Americans, which is almost precisely what the families closing their reproductive cycles had been having, which meant that you had one generation finishing up with about that number and a generation getting started with such big ideas. Moreover, family size preferences appeared to register the capacity of families to support their children since family size preferences were higher for high school graduates and even higher for college graduates than for elementary school level parents. Now, to bring these figures up to date, we should note that there's been a marked shift in family size preferences from 1967 to 1973, with the four or more size losing support in favor of two to three children. The four or more dropping from 40% supporting that size to 20%. In about six years, there's some volatility in this picture of family size goals. And the number preferring two or three children increasing for the same period from 50% to 69%. But note that from these same figures, and they are countrywide, and some of you may have noted Gallup, the Gallup poll reporting this, that there's no increase whatsoever in the repudiation of children, namely for no children. One percent think that's about right, no children. And there is about the same lack of support for one child, only one percent of the population in favor of one child. So that the bulk of the support is moving toward two or three children or more. We're seeing a marked value transformation, which may not yet have run full course, in the perception of children as valued assets. Back when I gave you that figure of eight children per family, Children were valued economic assets in the farm family enterprise. And then there was a shift to the perception of children as burdens and liabilities in the upward climb of achievement-oriented middle-class couples in the early decades of the 20th century. Then, in the post-World War II era, we see a third transformation to a perception of children as wanted items of consumption. This ought to give you a chill. Items of consumption to be enjoyed in preference to other goods, with each family deciding how many it could afford, and little knowing how costly they would be. According to Rainwater St. Louis respondents in the 1960s, the ideal was to have at least as many, but no more than you can afford. Now that's quite a calculation. It requires newly married couples to guess what their economic future is and risk being wrong because if they underestimate, there will be an indecent interval between the youngest child and the time they discover that they could have had more. Now, is that number tomorrow to be two, three, or four? For many of you, this may depend on couple, how couples define their economic prospects compared to their parents' prospects when they started out. 
For many Americans, having a medium-sized family may still be seen as a status symbol. As much evidence of financial success as the visible amassing of durable goods, automobiles, and a well-designed home. I well remember at Iowa State uh, University, my department head, when he discovered that we were expecting our fourth child, calling me in and saying, you arrogant pup, you. What makes you think that you can ever earn enough as a college professor to do right by four children? Well, he did sort of slow us up. We stopped with five, but uh, <laughs> he was implying that we were not paying attention to the norm of as many as you can afford but looking at at least as many as you might be able to afford if you are more successful than most college professors. And if I have worked nights and weekends, day in and day out without vacation, this good professor might say I'm trying to prove that I could afford what he said I was an arrogant pup to think I could afford. In a national sample of college educated in 1971, there was unanimous rejection of the one-child family. Too large didn't appear in their thinking until four children was reached. And 83% saw three children as not too many. Now, this juggling with figures that I've been talking about is an attempt to have us see that so long as people value children up to three, <laughs> so, van, so long as they view the central uh, feature of family life as something that they want to participate in maintaining, that the zero population growth advocates are going to have a hard time getting an acceptance of two children are enough and no children are even better. Yes, the climate for marriage and for parenthood has been very favorable in America, despite the impressions pervaded by the mass media whose feature writers stress deviance and breakdown of our society. I'm persuaded that the climate will continue to be favorable because the very value transformations that I've noted have occurred among the pace setters in the society, the college educated, the professional, the urbane sectors of the population. At least by their performance, it would appear that this is so. We should note, however, an avant-garde set of critics also from the college educated, professional, and, and urbane sectors who see the matter quite differently today, who are creating a counterculture to which I want to return later. Several books have been written espousing the new styles of the counterculture whose impact has yet to be assessed, but whose idealism cannot be denied. Now, may I present a less dramatic way of inferring the future of the family in this country, that is, to compare the youngest of three generations of the same family line as we've done in our recent research in Minnesota, noting the future of the family by the direction of change as we move from grandparents to their middle-aged children and on to their young married grandchildren. The sample studied consisted of 120 grandparent families ages 60 to 80, married about 1910. 120 parent families, ages 40 to 60, married in the 1930s. 120 married children, or grandchildren of these grandparents, if you will, married in the 1950s, ages 20 to 30. Now, they've all been married long enough to have had a number of common experiences, to have encountered a number of common uh, uh, 
tests, so to speak. These families were drawn from area probability samples of the Twin Cities and the hinterland of the Twin Cities. We find them dispersed through the metropolitan area. There are poor, working class, middle class, and rich families. But they have in common at least one set of grandparents living together, at least one set of parents living together for each married grandchild couple. Therefore, they were somewhat more stable residentially than other families. A number of changes over the three generations are notable. In average years of schooling completed, each generation surpasses its predecessor by an impressive margin, especially in the case of husbands. The superiority in education of wives over their husbands has decreased with each generation. In the grandparents, the wife had eight years of education and, the, and her husband had six. In the parent family, the wife had 11 and her husband nine. In the married child family, they both had about 12.6 years of education. No longer is the wife as likely to be more educated and the more literate member of the family. Did you have an idea that it was that way? That the women of the Twin Cities back, three generations back, were better educated than their husbands? Age at marriage has declined from 25.8 for grandfather to 23.6 for son to 21.9 for grandson, and from 21 for grandmother to 19.9 for granddaughter, showing a smaller age gap between spouses in the newest generation, down to two years age gap as against five years in the grandparent generation. What should that tell you? This young married child generation have about the same education, husband and wife, and they're much closer in age. The number of children born and their spacing is curvilinear, with the parent generation married during the Depression having progressively longer intervals between births from 18 months to five years compared with intervals of more nearly two years for the grandparents and the married child generations. The grandparent generation closed its family at 5.2 children, with over a fourth having eight or more children. The last child was born after 15 years of marriage, which stretched childbearing over a long period. They had a long period of being tied down with children. The parent, child, the parent generation closed its family at 3.5 children with over half in the two and three child categories, and their last child was born after 10 years of marriage. So they'd cut the period of childbearing down to 10 years, shortening the childbearing span by more than four years over the preceding generation. The married child generation still has over 20 years, still had at the point that I uh, uh, made the analysis, over 20 years of possible childbearing ahead but it had already produced more than two-thirds the number of the parent generation, averaging 2.4 children to date. So it's already past the two children or enough with 20 years still to go. It will surpass the parent generation, but will close its family earlier as a result of closer spacing in the early years. Only the young married child generation had a plan for the number of children. Only the young married child generation had budgeting economic planning as a part of their uh, shaping of their careers and their futures. Comparing the occupational careers of the three generations, the impression emerges of acceleration in upgrading in the youngest generation. The married child generation starts below the parent generation in less skilled jobs at the beginning of its career. But once underway in their chosen vocation within a few years after marriage, their rate of advancement is clearly, 
clearly faster than their parents was during the corresponding phase of their careers. By contrast with both the parent and the married child generation, the grandparent generation suffered the lowest start and the slowest movement upward over their entire working lives. If you look at their income, their housing, and their occupational achievements, they have a very flat curve. They were looking, they were living in a depressed, if you will, a depressed and futureless type of world in comparison with the two succeeding generations. In each successive generation, more of the wives have worked the first several years of marriage and more have returned to work as their children have grown up. In the married child generation, 60% of wives are working in the first years of marriage as compared with 20% of wives at the beginning of marriage in the parent generation. And although still in the childbearing period, 40% of the wives in the married child generation, married six to ten years, are employed. They moved down much less than the, than the middle generation did as they had their babies and were rearing them. With 40% still in the labor force with children under six, the impact of the working wife on level of income, home ownership, and acquisition of durable goods has been enormous in this young married child generation. Now, I didn't say what had happened to working wives among the grandparents. They almost never worked gainfully until the husband retired. And then they came into the labor force, and in their 70s and 80s, more of the grandparent generation wives are working than ever in their history. In all economic matters, the married child generation appears destined to outstrip the previous generations based on the achievement of each generation during the first 10 years of marriage. If we compare each generation during the first 10 years of marriage, uh, we have some dramatic uh, uh, pictures. Eighty percent of the married child generation has already exceeded the grandparent generation by becoming homeowners, an achievement reached by that proportion of the parent generation only after 20 years of marriage. In acquisition of durable goods, the married child generation has overtaken the grandparent generation and is at the point in its inventory where the parent generation was after 35 years of marriage. Actually, the married child generation starts with gifts and things that they've already earned to have a larger inventory than their grandparents currently have. The same can be said for bathroom and bedroom spaces in the home and other amenities. Now, this has not been done at the expense of protective insurances or retirement provisions, for the married child generation is well along in the acquisition of a portfolio of insurances and investments. Over 50% have retirement provisions over and beyond Social Security, and 95% have life insurance. This generation starts its marriage with 82% covered, which is higher than their grandparents ever reached and as high as their parents achieved after 30 years of marriage. Nelson Foote, in examining our findings, characterized the phenomenon of change over the generations as acceleration, not just linear upward movement, but changes occurring in a, at an accelerated rate, upgrading in education, in occupational composition toward professionalization, in income, in employment of wives, in upgrading of housing, and in the building of a durable goods inventory, and in progressive improvement in protective insurances and investments, all at an accelerated rate. Each generation has become more innovative, as is indicated by their receptiveness to adoption of new home products earlier in marriage. Now, certain other differences may seem more relevant to my topic tonight. You may say this sounds like is there a future for consumers? Uh, certain other differences may seem more relevant to the description of the family of the future since they refer to the family's value orientations, organization, and problem-solving behaviors. 
In value orientations, the two older generations are predominantly fatalistic, prudential, optimistic, and present or past-oriented, whereas the married child generation is the least fatalistic, is prudential, moderately optimistic, and oriented to the future rather than to the present or past. In family organization, there are marked differences appearing in the authority patterns, the division of labor, and the marital integration of families by generation. In authority patterns, the shift to equalitarian patterns is greatest from the grandparent to the parent generation, but it holds up into the married child generation. The generation gap was between grandparents and and this married child generation's parents, not between the parents and the married child generation. In division of tasks, there is more sharing of tasks and less specialization in the married child generation, as well as less attention to the conventions about what is men's work and women's work. Consensus on family values improves, but role integration is better in the grandparent generation than it is in the, in the married child generation. Marital communication is especially low in the grandparent generation where role integration is highest. It's almost as if you each know and share a common set of values and a common set of notions of how to go about your work. Why is there a need to talk? In the observations in the joint interview that uh, our interviewers had with both husband and wife, and we had five interviews with one of them, especially set up for husband and wife, in which differences between the spouses were generated by posing difficult questions which they were expected to answer as a pair, the interviewers found, her a, found a greater readiness to enter into conflict among the youngest generation. The parent generation was loath to enter into conflict, slow to express hostility toward one another, but also proved to be lower on the achieved solution to the issues raised. The pattern of the youngest generation was frequently, frequently one of identifying differences, engaging in conflict, then locating a basis for agreement with one party undertaking to smooth over the differences and seeking to save face afterward so that everyone seemed to feel all right about it. Altogether, the interviewers found the youngest generation the most colorful, interesting. The couples of this generation were both most likely to experience conflict and to express hostility, but they were also most likely to conclude with consensus and gestures of affection. Finally, what about the planning and problem-solving performance of the three generations over the year's period of observation? In each successive generation, the number of plans expressed was greater and the number of actions taken during the year was greater and the proportion of actions that were pre-planned was greater. Here, the differences may only reflect the stage and family development of the representatives of each generation. The married child generation makes many plans and carries out many actions because it's in an expanding phase of need. What is interesting, however, is that the so-called flighty young generation is the most likely to pre-plan its purchases, its residential moves, and its other consumer actions with 51% of its actions during the year pre-planned compared with 44% in the grandparent generation who have plenty of time to plan but don't. Moreover, the components of rational decision-making are more faithfully met in the married child generation than in its antecedents. That is, the child generation is more likely than the more seasoned to search for information outside the immediate family, to weigh costs and, uh, and satisfactions among alternatives, and to take into account long-term as well as short-term consequences of an action. Well, from this analysis, I think you'd agree with me that we have a picture of the American family of the future, of the future emerging that is genuinely hopeful and optimistic. 
increasing effectiveness in problem solving, increasing professional competence and economic well-being, families of greater courage and risk-taking accompanied by greater planning, demonstrating greater flexibility in family organization with substantially better communication accompanied by more conflict between the spouses. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of the phenomenon of reaction formation which is supposed to suggest a turn to the right politically. Indeed, this married generation, married child generation, which has enjoyed the material amenities, has already chosen to elaborate the non-material values of home and children. Their educational aspiration for their own children are the highest of the three generations, and from their plans, they are putting more of their proceeds into the children than into their own uh, living. Now, let me conclude with a statement I made earlier. When viewed historically, more options are open to families today, and even more will be tomorrow, to experiment, to invent, and innovate than in any previous epoch. Ours is a period of freedom to develop styles of living more consonant with the personality needs of children and adults, and for Dr. Bernard's sake, both women and men, than was possible to our parents and grandparents. The so-called counterculture is just such an embodiment of innovations, some new, some old, dating to the 1800s and the 1920s. Some of these innovations may prove unworkable and destructive. It's too early to judge. But some may offer greater potentialities for personal growth than conventional patterns. Dual career families have been underway for some time where both parents pursue professional one-half-time careers and both assume half-time responsibility for household and house-husband tasks as well as child-rearing. And now Sweden has passed enabling legislation encouraging such careers and giving some uh, uh, concessions to um, industrial programs that uh, make it possible to have such careers. Gustavus Adolphus has uh, a prof two professors working out of one full-time contract with one professor teaching in one department half-time and in another department half-time and taking their shifts at home uh, the other half-time. Churches are increasingly permitting innovations in the wedding ceremony. Who may perform it? with Catholic Protestant pastors sharing in a mixed marriage. Other changes in the form and content of the ceremony, some couples marrying themselves, others involving the parents and friends in the audience to join in their commitment. And the words they say in these ceremonies have been put together by them and often give a picture of both the goals and the means that enter into the covenant. Some unions, to be sure, have dispensed with all ceremonies, trial unions without benefit of marriage ceremony, living in unions, serial unions, group marriages, homosexual households, wife swapping, communal or cooperative households with and without children are among the experiments that we know to be underway within the Twin Cities, not in great numbers, but sufficiently visible to be observed and studied. I heartily recommend that Augsburg social scientists join in studying these. We have much to learn from these experiments, enough to be observed. The basis for the family's strength and survival over the centuries seems to be its unique process of renewal each generation. Family has this unique process of renewal each generation, namely the determination of each generation 
not to do unto others what has been done to them. Each generation is enabled in this sense to start afresh, they think, playing roles without script until they tire and turn to scripts, often profiting from the errors of the past generation to lay the basis for a new scripture. These may be reasons enough for my prediction that there is a bright future for marriage and parenthood. The family of the future will be changed in form and structure, to be sure. But I expect, given this opportunity of renewal each generation, it will be more functional for women and children especially than the family as we know it today. Thank you.